56 years ago in 1967, Ferrari launched their first mid-engine supercar, the Dino 206 GT. Fast forward 43 years to 2010, the first 458 Italia went into production. Today we're going to seek to answer that age-old question. Is the 458 the best modern classic Ferrari supercar? Many comparisons can be made between the Dino 206 GT and the Ferrari 458. The Dino 206 has a mid-mounted V6, whereas the Ferrari 458 has a mid-mounted V8. Now the V6 in the 206 is mounted transversely, whereas downstream from the 308 onwards, the engines are mounted longitudinally. Other comparisons that can be made are that from the V6 downstream to the Ferrari 458 and 488, FA, etc., etc., downstream, a flat plane crankshaft was implemented. And this provides some of the characteristics that we know and love about our Ferrari supercars the ability for them to rev so high, and also that beautiful sound, that symphonic sound you hear above certain RPM. In addition, from the 206 onwards to the Ferrari 458, all those supercars were styled by Pininfarina. Now, I haven't forgotten about all the Ferrari supercars downstream from the 458, the 488, the F8, the 296, etc. I've been very fortunate to drive some fantastic Ferrari supercars, and I'll be incorporating those into the assessment when we get out and drive my 458. Having driven my 458 and owned it for three years and put 11,000 miles on it, we realized we still haven't provided you a review of the 458, so we're going to be incorporating that into our assessment today. So I'm going to give you a quick walk around of my actual 458 Spider. Now I'm not going to go into great detail. If you want to see full details of my recommended spec and my minimum recommended specification for purchasing a 458, then please check out my 458 Buyer's Guide, link in the description below. So I'm going to give you a summary overview of my car. It's in Rosso Corsa, which was named Resale Red. Resale Red, why? why? Well, because it was the easiest colour for Ferrari to resell in their dealerships so a lot of cars were specced in resale red so it's Rosso Corsa on the exterior it's got a black Nero interior the wheels are bright silver it's got carbon ceramics with the yellow caliper so the yellow calipers was an option with Ferrari unlike unlike Porsche you can separately option yellow or whatever really color calipers you want it's not like with Porsche where you have yellow calipers for the ceramic brakes and you usually have red for steels. My 458 has the AFS lighting system. In effect, it's incorporated with lift, so you can't option one without the other. You can't option lift without incorporating AFS because AFS um, allows the car or allows the headlights to follow the steering. So whichever way you, you turn the steering wheel, the lights follow, they move in association. And that's important because if you've got a lift on the car, then you need the lights to lift up in association with how far or how high the car is lifted. Obviously you've got the Scuderia badges on the side. Now they're a thousand pound option, so they don't come standard, which is, which is really surprising. I've recently put Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's on my car. They don't come standard, just usually Pirelli P's, Pirelli P0's, which is what mine came standard with. Um, when we walk around the back of the car, this back section, this end cap back section, this is in carbon. Um, this was known as the challenge grille on cars like the 360 and the 355 but this is in full carbon fiber standard it's actually in body color so it would be in Rosso Corsa we've got a reversing camera here I haven't got the sports exhaust so it's standing exhaust and I haven't got the carbon rear diffuser so those are two of the few things that aren't incorporated in the specification on my car so if we move to the interior Excuse all the, the gubbins in the center console of my phone and my sunglasses. So driver's zone incorporated. So you've got the LED lights, carbon steering wheel, carbon surround on the dash. All this optioned in carbon. So all the vents, side vents and the inlays across on the passenger side, all optioned in carbon. The center console is a very special item on my car. Not only is the center section of the center console optioned in carbon, but also the side panels. That is very, very rare. So quickly moving forward to this, we've got 
pit speed, which is actually cruise control. You've got the beautiful, stunning carbon sports seats. So carbon back racing sports seats. In my view, are pretty much essential if you want to retain value in your car. It's just, you know, hate me in the comments below. It's just fact. <laughs> Black Nero leather, full leather interior. This center stripe, this center tri flag, tri color flag was a very special option for my car and was like an Italia option to have this, to have the Italian flag stitched into the center section of both seats. So really pleased about that. Ferrari embossed, embroidered into the rear of the headrest. Standard seat belts, so nothing peculiar about that. These mats are actually been provisioned by a friend. Thanks again, Martin. Martin gave me, gave me these mats from his 458 Italia when he sold it. We have the electrochromatic door mirrors. With that functionality, you also get the ability to fold them in, which is great when you're moving the car into a tight space like ga most garages. And with, the, with that electro, electrochromatic door mirrors option, you also get what I think is the better looking rear view mirror. Otherwise you get the thin, ugly looking one, in my opinion. Again, hate me in the comments below, it's just fact. Now this car also has start stop, would you believe it? So the battery is configured in a separate way. You have a different earth terminal, which is, provides an easy release, but a pain in the ass when you change the battery, as I found out recently. Um, but that additional capability for the battery, the, the additional battery earth post is provided for the start cast configured start stop. And guys, the start stop option was named High emotion, low emission, go figure. It always has the JBL stereo upgrade and it has the iPod connectivity so as you can put a Bluetooth streaming device in the glove box. That's pretty much it. I've probably missed a few things. It's also got the yellow ref counter, yellow backed ref counter, um, but it's one of the highest spec 458s you can possibly get. Um, I was just very fortunate. I bought the car, right car at the right time. It's just, just how it was. Just very, very lucky to get this specification. So now I'm going to take the 458 on the road. I'm going to talk you through some comparisons of the cars that I have experience of. Three years experience, 11,000 miles, mod ball rally, European trip, the European trip alone was 3,100 miles. I'm going to talk you through comparing my experience of driving the car across all those different terrains and different events. And all the cars that I've driven come to video on our channel. I'll be contrasting and comparing against cars such as the 328, the 355, obviously my 458, the F8, Tributo and Spider, and the 296. I'll also throw a bit of a, a curveball comparison against the F12 in there, and you'll understand why later. So let's get the car out on that road. criteria I'm going to use today to evaluate the 458 and to answer that main key question I posed at the beginning of this video and that is is the 458 the best modern classic Ferrari supercar the two criteria I'm going to use are driving characteristics and styling now there's not much driving comparisons that I can do with the 206 and the 246 because I haven't driven them yet I'm hoping to get into a Dino at some point in the near future to provide you a cool review for, for the channel. But as yet, I haven't driven a 206 or a 246, so I can't provide a driving characteristics comparison. So it's interesting to look back at how it all started with the Dino 206. That car was released with 178 brake horsepower and 138 pound-foot of torque. Fast forward 43 years to 2010, when the 458 went into production, and the 458 has 562 brake horsepower, depending on who you speak to, and 398 pound-foot of torque. So, as you'd expect, a substantial improvement in performance. I think you can agree, guys, there's not much that beats that sound. the 
that I've driven, the 328. The 328, awesome styling. Beautifully styled Pininfarina bodywork. Absolutely beautiful car. But because of the driving position, you've got that slight angled driving position where your feet are angled compared to your body. For me, it was, it was quite uncomfortable. And I'm a bit too big for a car like that, to be honest. So the whole cabin was quite uncomfortable for me. Beautiful car and stunning interior. So really loved the styling of the car. Um, but regards to the performance, the driving capability, the seated position for me wasn't great. For a smaller person, probably a lot better. Um, with respect to driving characteristics, it's an old car at the end of the day, you know. It's a 1989 car, that particular car that we drove. Link in the description below to the video. And moving on to the 355. Now, most of my viewers will know that I absolutely adore the styling of the 355. In my opinion, it's one of the most beautiful cars that has ever been designed. And again, designed by Pininfarina. Beautifully styled. And most people would say that's one of the most beautiful Ferraris that's ever been made. Inside the cabin, I felt it was really comfortable. No problems there, a good seated position, um, well enough room. I wasn't too cramped in the driving position and it wasn't too angled. Um, I think there was a slight angle to the left, but pretty much whereas you wouldn't notice it. And um, it was a left-hand drive car that I, that I drove as well. Absolutely sounds awesome. And that particular car had a Capristo exhaust as well. So sounded awesome looked awesome sounded awesome just what you'd expect from a 355 and just what you hear about the chassis again not something that would class as a modern classic because the chassis is aged on that car and it felt aged when i was driving it it was a beautiful car and i'm not taking anything away from the 355 but to my opinion it just didn't hold the road it just didn't have the road dynamics that you'd get with a, what i would call a mod classic supercar and with the 458 the dynamics you get with a 458 the performance of the 355 as well was again sounded fantastic but it's an old car you know those cars were released in around uh, the same time as my 993 so they overlapped around the 19 the late 1990s the brake dynamics on the 3 to 8 were, were pretty good especially considering the age of the car being a 1989 car the brakes were pretty good i found also the, the steering dynamics on the 3 to 8 too heavy and it had a quite a slow rack so the turning wasn't very sharp great to drive again being a 328 awesome car to look at and the styling interior awesome car to look at the interior as well and the 355 again great interior really love that the interior styling it's just classic you know both of them having the manual gated shift so that's that gated that metal ferrari gated shift which is just an incredible classic addition to a, to a ferrari mid-engine supercar but again the steering on the 355 um, felt heavy it wasn't assisted um, I don't believe it was assisted um, and there seemed to be I mean it may have been an issue with something to do with, with the dynamics of that particular car but it seemed like the steering was loose in comparison to, to later cars it just didn't have the same setup um, the steering wasn't anywhere near as fast um, I mean you know you get you, you get used to it you get babied by these new cars or buy these modernish cars this car is still eight years old it's, it's far from new but you get used to these modern characteristics these modern abilities these modern options like you know the, the steering so being directed pointing such a fast steering rack um, so three to eight also the, the steering felt numb and the 355 didn't feel much better if i'm being really honest i really need to drive a 348 because apparently the 348 the steering is really spot on so I really need to drive a 348 to get in comparison. So if any of you guys got a 348 and you'll be happy for me to perform a review on it, then please let me know in the comments below. Or drop me a comment and I'll get in touch with you. The brakes on the 355 as well were pretty good. I know that they've been upgraded by the owner as well. Um, so no issues with the brake inside there. Obviously not as performant as a modern classic, so something like a 458, but still pretty good for the age. Now comparing the gates to 430, Unfortunately, I haven't driven a base 430. I've driven a 430 Scuderia, and the 430 Scuderia felt great. I really love the 430 Scuderia. So I would say that the 430 Scuderia is the closest thing in comparison at the moment uh, to a 458 with regards to being the best modern classic. I'd say the 430 Scuderia comes pretty close. I'd love to drive a 16M, the Spider version of the Scuderia, but 
very unlikely to be able to get into one of those they're so rare but if any of you guys have got a 16m and you're happy for me to review it let me know in the comments below i'd really really love to review a 16m for the channel so to provide a summary review of my 458 i've had this for three years and i've driven it for 11,000 miles in those three years so i pretty much know the car fairly well so trying to separate myself away from the owner of ownership experience and looking at raw characteristics of this car steering fast means you don't have to take your hands off the steering wheel you keep you keep your hands about quarter to slot with 10 to 10 past and you don't have to remove your hands from steering wheel unless you're doing a massively aggressive u-turn then maybe you have to cross your hands but all other circumstances when you're turning all other circumstances when you're turning you keep your hands on the steering wheel there's no problems whatsoever so the speed of the steering rack is pretty much perfect turning fantastic dead sharp on the 458 performance well you've seen it on the channel before guys what more do you need to know it's got all the performance you could need on the road and more opinion as I detailed before I've got most of my length in my legs so I need to have a good amount of space in the footwell which I have no problems whatsoever this, the driving position is straight ahead um, there's maybe maybe a slight angle to the left but not that you'd notice it all the controls lay themselves to hand no problem whatsoever the 458 of course was the first mid-engine Ferrari supercar that had all the controls put on the steering wheel care of the design integration with Michael Schumacher so you've got the, the indicators control, the lights, the, the bumpy road mode, good old bumpy road mode. Um, and you've got the, the Manatino, all the configurations for the adjustment on performance, engagement, and associated with the suspension setup, all on the Manatino settings. The paddles, again, are fixed. They're behind the steering column, they're in, so they don't move with the steering wheel. I find that's great because they're well long enough. You know where they are. They're not moving with the steering wheel, so you can catch them and change gear whenever you want to. No problems there. You're not going to miss a gear. And also, of course, you can switch it into water mode whenever you like, if you want to relax, if you're in town, etc. I did a quite a lot of that during the European trip. Whenever we dropped into a town, small village, um, whenever, whenever we're in traffic, I just put it into auto mode, just relax. And especially on the motorway as well and just let the car carry on and change gear for me <laughs> that ain't never gonna get old guys never get old anyway getting back to it again I'm, I'm getting distracted getting back to it again you've got the the, the cutaway in the steering wheel is perfectly designed so you can see the gauges so you can see the screen to the left the screen to the right of the main ref counter which of course is centrally mounted that's the key gauge that you need to be observant of all the time so you don't make sure you over so you make sure you don't over rev the engine of course you've got the led lights here the rev the rpm red uh, of course you've got the rpm red led lights across the top of the steering wheel so because that was optioned with the driving zone um, with this steering wheel configuration you have that which is a, a very important visual cue all the information you can need there is at hand you get used to changing the screens around and configuring them to how you want them set up pretty much since the mod ball rally i always now have the left hand screen set up to show me the temperatures of the wheels and the temperatures more pertinent more pertinent of the tires i always like to know what the temperature of the tires are so with that type of spirited driving that we've been doing today guys it's a bit cooler day today but we've got the temperature up to 42 degrees on the front tires and it's important to make sure that you don't try and drive spirited fashion with these sort of cars until the tire temperature is up so the tpms system that provides those temperature sensors that gives you that feedback that vital in my opinion feedback is essential in my opinion if you want to take these cars on something like a european driving trip moving on now to the f8 i have driven a 488 so i can't provide a comparison there but we can say that the f8 is pretty much has a similar dynamics to the 488 albite obviously it doesn't sound the same because the f8 has particulate filters whereas the 488 didn't the 488 sound 
from what I from what I've heard, especially from the 488 Pista that was on the European trip with us, sounded really good when it was ticking over, but not so great when it was on point. Um, so it lost a lot of the sound dynamics when it was at pace. With regards to the F8, I drove the Tributo and the Spider. Incredibly capable car, not so keen on the styling. I found the, the styling of the F8 too angular, again, my opinion, but I just found them too cumbersome, the styling, too angular, and I just do not like those air intakes on the rear haunches. I think it ruins the styling on the cars, unless you're talking about the 296. They've incorporated the intercooler air intakes um, pretty much the engine air intakes on the 296 very well but on the on the 488 and the F8 not so much and also on the SF90 to be honest as well I'm not too keen on the way they've they've styled those rear haunches those those intercooler air intakes not great in my opinion um, so not too keen on the styling of the F8 um, just doesn't have the clean Pinafarina lines that you have in the 458 <laughs> You don't get that in an F8. You get it in a 355 with a Capristo, but still not the same in my opinion. I know it's going to garner a few disappointed opinions across the board, but I would say that the 458 sounds better than the 355 with a Capristo. A different sound, the 355 sounds awesome with a Capristo, but in my opinion, it's just more of a better baritone sound when a 458 is on point. Not so much when it's at low RPM, but when it's on point, I think so. With regards to the driving dynamics of the F8, incredible car, incredibly capable car. The performance is nothing short of astronomical. The F8, in effect, has the 488 Pista engine in it, which uh, much to the grievance of 488 Pista owners because they thought they were getting a very special engine car, and in effect, Ferrari and going to put pretty much the same engine in the F8 in a standard production run car. So, yeah, not so great, but uh, that's Ferrari for you. Very, very capable, the F8. Incredible dynamics, but you've, for me to get the sensual feeling out of the car, I had to rant the hell out of it. You've got to just push it too hard, and you're pushing it so hard, you're at crazy speeds that it just gets dangerous. To get that sensual engagement, to get that sensuality from the car, you just don't feel it at the lower speeds. You just don't feel it at 458 speeds, which is road speeds. You can drive the 458 in a very spirited fashion, but still be within speed limits. You can't with the F8. To get that feedback and to get that central engagement, just part of the central engagement, you've got to thrash an F8. And even then, you still don't get the central attachment that you get with a 458. I know that sounds crazy, but that's just how it is, guys. In, in my opinion, I've pretty much written off the F8. Sorry for those who own an F8. Just in my opinion, I just didn't like the styling. And the driving performance was phenomenal, but you have to thrash it to get that sensual engagement that you get with a 458. And this is why people love the 458. And this is also why people have bought 488s and F8s um, having previously owned 458s and sold them and gone back to a 458. That says a lot, guys. Now, I was also fortunate enough to drive a 296 with a Fiorano pack. I drove that on the road, just for a short spell on the road, but mostly at the Millbrook Proving Ground. Awesome experience. Incredibly capable car. Absolutely loved the car. Loved the 296. It was a 296 GTB, so it wasn't the GTS. I think if I was going to buy one of those, it'd be the GTS. Just, well, that's why I bought a 458 Spider, so you get the open top air dynamics. But again, with a 296, incredibly capable car. You just, for me, I didn't get that central engagement again. You just don't get that without with any other car other than the 458. It's very close. The 296 is an awesome, capable car, and it's styled beautifully. I absolutely love the styling of the 296. I prefer it without the Fiorano stripe, in my opinion. I think that damages the styling of the car. But the, the rest of the styling, I think, is fantastic. I think they've incorporated 
the air intakes, the engine air intake very well into the rear haunches of the car. It looks quite a low footprint on the road. It's, it certainly seems a massively smaller footprint than the F8. It just looks super cool, the 296. And it feels it as well. When you're in the car, you, you feel like you've got plenty of room around you. I'm six foot one, all my length is in my legs. Um, and I had plenty of room in that 296, especially in the driver's compartment. So no issues whatsoever there with room and with the dynamics of the car, uh, the, the visual dynamics of the car look stunning. But again, the performance, brutally quick, but it just lacked that engagement. It lacked that soul. It just doesn't have that soul that the 458 has. This car has it in spades. You can see why people buy the 458 and you can see why people, they, they buy the, the later cars from having a 458 and then they move back into the 458 and they're often gutted that they decided to sell a 458. The 296, in my opinion, is a substantial improvement on the sound of the F8. It's a lot better styled and it sounds a lot better as well. They, they certainly move forward with the 296. I think they realized that they moved back a bit with the F8. Again, the F8, the 488 and the F8 moved away from Pinafrina styling. It was the, the 488 and the F8 and the 296 are styled in, internally within Ferrari. Uh, but they obviously got, their, got the issues resolved and decided to come back to core standards with the 296 and they got it right with regards to styling. And yeah, the traction control and the electronic in, the systems on that car are incredibly capable. When I was driving it around the Billbrook track, absolutely incredible. The way that thing stuck to the road and held its own going round corners still bewilders me now, to be honest. It's like it was breaking the laws of physics. But on the road, you've got to absolutely nail it. You've got to crucify on the road to get that performance, to get that to get any central field feedback and for me it just isn't the same as driving a 458 it just isn't all those comparisons are made against the experience that i have driving my 458 for three years across 11,000 miles now i put a lot of miles on this car in that short short space of time guys 11,000 miles i bet there's few people who can say they put that amount of mileage on their car in three years when i say their car i mean a ferrari supercar when it's not a mid-engine supercar the reason is because having the experience of driving my 458 for both the mod ball rally of for four, for a thousand miles on the mod ball rally and for over three thousand miles on the european trip many different types of terrain across those three years i've driven this car and across those two events in particular the mod ball rally and the european trip switchbacks mountain climbing um, mount, uh, motorway driving, all sorts. You'd think it'd be really tiring driving a mid-engined modern classic supercar like the 458. Fast steering, quick to turn in, um, edgy, poten potentially edgy on the throttle. Not a bit of it, guys. In the first day when we drove down to Baden-Baden, we did about 12 hours on and off driving. Now we stopped for coffees, etc. And of course the Euro Tunnel across. But the car was really, really comfortable. No problem at all, no problem whatsoever. Now I would say, unlike many other supercars, the, the sports race seats, um, probably buckets in many other cars, the sports race seats on a 458 are very, very comfortable. So 
I, I find these seats really, really comfortable. I find they really support you really well. And most people I talk to who own 458s who have the carbon brace seats also say that they're very, very comfortable. The driving position as well, the 458, pretty much nailed it. Um, very comfortable driving, all those 12 hours, never had any issues whatsoever. Um, never had any issues whatsoever for all that 12 hours that I was driving the 458 on the European trip. And it was a pleasure to drive. I didn't find the steering too fast. I could say yes, maybe the steering of the, of the, of the F12 Bellinetta with a slight bit of tolerance there would be a little bit easier on the motorway. But to be honest with you guys, I didn't really notice it. I found it was fine. I found the 458 was fine on all those, all that driving. Um, I just didn't feel tired at all. I mean, I felt tired from the point of view of all those hours in the day when we were out and about and doing things. So that was tiring and being on it with regards to the, the, the mountain pass driving that we were doing. But with regards to being in the 458 and the 458 being a tiring experience over that length of time that we were driving over that 3,000 miles and those eight days, no, it was great. So I could pose a question for you guys there to answer me in the comments below. What do you reckon? Do you reckon the 458 is a better GT car for events like the, a European driving trip where you're taking the car across to Europe and you're driving mountain passes, would you say, in your opinion, that the 458 is a better car to provide a better experience for that sort of a trip than a car like an F12 Berlinetta? driving trip where you're doing mountain passes, motorway driving etc. What's your criteria? What's your opinion? Is the 458 a better driving experience overall? My opinion, yes. Let me know in the comments below. There's a good reason for it guys, a very, very good reason for it. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure you give the video a like guys, very important for the channel. If you're not subscribed, please think about subscribing. Again, very, very important for the channel to help us move forward. Thanks a lot for watching guys, and let me know your thought process in the comments below, and we'll catch you in the next video. If you're driving it like that, how the f*** could you need more than this? I'm not using all the performance there.